audience and all the participants that came at uh, the opening of the MIT uh, Enterprise Forum with uh, the companies, representative of the companies, uh, in this case Mirantis, uh, Wix, and uh, Credorax. Uh, so, first of all, greetings to all the distinguished speakers here, to Ayla, to uh, Professor Schertmann, to uh, Alex uh, Friedland from uh, Mirantis, Nir Zohar from Wix, and uh, Eagle Rotem, uh, the former chairperson of uh, Credorex, distinguished visitors and uh, students, I hope this is intended for students as well. Uh, the, the MIT uh, Forum uh, for Enterprise is uh, important because it emphasizes what we also believe in the university very much, which is to make a contact, to make a connection, a viable connection between the basic science and the applied science. And we want to encourage researchers and students to do as many things in conjunction with practical things that can be put to practice and to the help and the aid uh, of the public. And uh, we put a lot of effort into that uh, and uh, we are trying to give the researchers both incentive and conditions uh, that will uh, enable them uh, to do so. So the fact that it's under the auspices of the MIT is not very surprising because the MIT, I think, is number one or two. They, they compete with Princeton, so I always get mixed up in uh, uh, terms of uh, the number of patents and enterprises and so on. But Tel Aviv University, uh, at least if we look at uh, Israel and even worldwide, if you look at uh, the number, uh, um, the ranking of universities in the world uh, for people that have founded uh, companies, startups, and people that recruited the amount of, uh, the largest amount of money for startups, then Tel Aviv University, and this is a survey that was done in the US, if I remember correctly, Tel Aviv University is ranked number 10 in the world, and the only one from uh, non-US uh, universities uh, to be in that. So at least it means that we do give uh, the correct education and uh, possibilities uh, to the uh, students that we uh, grow here. And uh, this connection, the connection between uh, basic science and companies is very important. I think it should be emphasized further, and I hope that uh, the future will see also that companies will invest directly in research in the universities. And this is because the university has the professors that want to do research, and they want to innovate, and they have uh, the capacity to do so. And there are many students who are let us say, not even spoiled by the uh, going in the normal track all the time, and therefore they are even uh, more likely to come up with ir irregular ideas, which may, may uh, benefit the society a lot. And the support uh, from the government for these uh, uh, cooperations, it exists, but it's not enough. And I think that the companies, if they use the ability of the scientists in the university to invent can benefit a lot from it. And of course the scientists will benefit from that too because it will enable them to uh, push their research, which in the uh, natural sciences, as you know, is very much limited uh, by our ability to recruit the appropriate resources. So this will uh, benefit both sides and together I think that uh, it is doable. So I hope that uh, this uh, meeting here uh, will be uh, fruitful in that direction and uh, that all of us uh, will uh, march together for a better and inventive future. Thank you. Thank you, Yoan, for this uh, welcome. And off we go.
Uh, okay. Well, what do we have tonight? Okay. I'd like to spend the next 10 minutes discussing growth versus exit. Okay, we hear a lot of criticisms about entrepreneurs selling their companies or selling too fast. And I'd like to discuss this uh, question. And first, I'd like to start with two misconceptions. When we speak about exit, when entrepreneurs speak about exit, they often think about selling their companies and going to the beach with their pockets filled with money. And this is not the case. In, in fact, Exit is the way for investors, in particular, to get out of the company and to get a return on their investments. Okay, that's a common way for venture capitalists. And they speak about exit and exit strategy. However, when the company is sold, oftentimes the entrepreneurs are locked in. They have to stay in the company normally for at least three years before they can leave the company. In the case of an IPO, they have to stay again for a while, and they can only cash out on their um, shares after a while, again, normally three years. Now, what we see is that the success of the merger when a company is sold is often dependent on the CEO of the company being acquired. Okay? And Dr. Neil Briller from Tel Aviv University, right now at the Haifa University, has a very interesting piece of research that speaks about the success and about the responsibility of the CEO, the acquired CEO, of the success of the merger. And in fact, what we see is three kinds of mergers. One is when the, the purchasing company mainly acquires technology and talent. The second is when there's already a product. And the third, when there is a platform, that when the company is more advanced. And what Neil saw in his research was that there was a huge responsibility on the shoulders of the acquired CEO. That means that the success of the merger lies on both sides, both the acquiring and the acquired company. We've seen quite a few interesting success stories. We all know about Indigo being purchased by HP. What happened after the purchase is that the sales of, H, of Indigo using the market channels of HP grew five times fold. From $200 million per annum, they went up to a billion dollars per annum. Uh, Igor Rotem will, will soon speak about Credorax. However, his previous company, Power Design, was acquired by another NASDAQ-traded company called MicroSemi. And what happened was that the core business of power design became the main growth en uh, engine of MicroSemi, and the company actually doubled in valuation soon after the acquisitions. And to these days, the activities of MicroSemi in Israel through power design are thriving. A very well known newer example is the acquisition of Extreme IO by EMC. I spoke to Gil Gorin earlier today. EMC was purchased by uh, purchased the Extreme IO when the company was not in sales yet. This happened three years ago, three and a half years ago. Using EMC's channels and manpower, what we saw was sales of $1 billion on the first year of sales. This was last year, 2014, $1 billion sales of the Extreme IO product. And these numbers are about to double when 2015 is concluded. We see that M&A is a legitimate way to grow, all right? Now look, let's look at this at a historical perspective, all right? If we look at the Israeli economy in the 50s and 60s, this was still an economy of a developing country. It was based on agriculture and tourism. In the 70s, we saw the first multinationals coming to Israel. Mikir Oder of IBM is sitting here. And Joe Raviv opened the first uh, center of IBM. 
we saw Intel, we saw national semiconductors. In the 80s, we saw more multinationals in Israel, and we heard, we read in the papers, a lot of criticism that Israeli engineers are wasting their talents for global companies. But in fact, what happened, this was the greatest school in the world. And the Israelis learned how to start their own companies. And in the 90s, when we had the Bird Foundation, and we had the Madan Rashi, the chief scientist office, and we had a venture capital industry forming, we saw startup nation becoming what it is today. And what we would like to discuss today is what is happening to us now, as of year 2000. And uh, the three companies that will present as of now will speak about grow up nation, not just startup nation. I have to also to mention that um, in my discussion with the Gil Goren from EMC, he mentioned that three of the employees of Extreme IO that were acquired by EMC have already started their own companies, having been exposed to the uh, uh, way EMC manages to marketing uh, techniques, and EMC is investing in all three. Now, we have to take into account that a major venue of growth is going public, either at NASDAQ, which is a very common place for Israelis to go public, or at the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange, which is making uh, a lot of effort to uh, suit itself to young startups, Israeli startups. What are we going to see today? We will be speaking on the national level first. Professor Dan Shechtman of the Technion will discuss his activity in, in kindergartens. He told me today that he liked my suggested uh, title of Love Thy Science. And this is what he's trying to do in kindergartens in Haifa and in Israel nowadays. After that, we will hear of Nir Zohar, of president of Wix, about his activity to convince more and more companies to grow via IPO, to become large companies, and working with the government and other institutes. Later on, we'll hear the very interesting Credorax, a company that's growing extremely fast, run by repeat entrepreneur Igal Rotem. And uh, finally, we will, have, we will hear Alex Friedland, founder and CEO of Mirantis, about this incredible company whose valuation right now is said to be over $800 million. Before I hand over the microphone to Dan, I would like to refer to the uh, term, to the term, to the term unicorn, all right? A lot of the people I talked to in the last few days didn't uh, know this term. And what we mean when we speak about the economic meaning of a unicorn, we're speaking about a company that's, whose valuation is $1 billion or more, which is still private, which is very unusual, just like unicorns. Dan, will you please take the microphone? Dan Chechman of the Technion. Thank you. 